Welcome to the presidential panel. Uh, we should get started. The complex system by which we communicate the results of our research and thinking to various audiences is a central part of the scholarly life. It has a profound impact both on how we do our work and on how others receive it. It is part of both the more solitary and the more social dimensions of our existence. But not all of us delve too deeply into the machinery of this system. I am, for better or worse, one of those who have, uh, but it was only when I started to prepare these remarks that I realized fully just how much scholarly communication has been a continuing uh, motif throughout my career. I began at the bottom as a shipping clerk uh, when Alan Samuel first got the American Society of Papyrologists, a newly born minnow of an organization back then, into publishing by beginning a monograph series with the Feshrift for C. Bradford Wells. I filled the orders from a box under my desk in the Yale Classic Slide Library. The result was that I got fired by, <laughs> by the department chair who was Wells's arch enemy. <laughs> I did not learn my lesson, but instead during graduate school got into copy editing and production. By then, Samuel had started a publishing firm, the first of several, uh, and over the years, typing camera-ready copy, computer typesetting, microfiche publishing, and involvement in a nonprofit consortial press followed. It was inevitable that when I became the director of a new institute nine and a half years ago, a publishing venture would follow, and you will hear about this soon. Those of you who have been active across most or all of this past half century, and I'm happy to see that that's not by any means everybody in the room, will perhaps have noted that it has been an era of perpetual crisis in scholarly communications. Or so at least you would believe if you read the stream of portentous Jeremiads on the subject that has flowed through the academic ecosystem of publishing, at least since the report of a commission sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies, published in 1979 but underway for several years before that, and driven by the circumstances of the economic downturn in higher education that followed the election of Richard Nixon in 1968 and then the oil crisis of the 1970s. We have apparently, in fact, lived in permanent crisis all of these years. I'm sure you know the storyline. The inexorable rise of journal costs has eaten the budget for monographs. Fewer and fewer copies are sold, making the academic book an expensive endangered species. Academics don't write for a broad enough audience, but instead wallow in arcane detail. University presses are at risk of closing because of the convergence of these trends. Journals are losing most of their articles to conference volumes and thematic collections. <clears throat> now, the odd thing is that all of these are more or less true statements. And one could add grumbling about the resulting evaporation of competent copy editing. Yet, editors roam the convention and our department corridors looking for more of these unreadable manuscripts to bring to a world that will not buy them. And the number of books being published seems to grow every year rather than shrink. And I say nothing of the fake or garbage journals and conferences uh, that are constantly soliciting our articles, those scams that Kevin Carey wrote about recently, preying on those desperate to present or publish. But underneath the repetitive character of these complaints lies real and significant change. The marginal cost of putting a book or article online for all to read uh, for free is low, and the more free material there is, the more widespread becomes the belief that everything should be free. Digital technology has also reduced the cost of typesetting in real dollars over the past 40 years. As in other industries, scale has become critical. It is harder to be small and stay in business than it once was, partly because the investment in today's technology is substantial. 
The basic tenets of peer review are being debated as never in my adult lifetime. And to be honest, a lot of the peer review that gets done, even for the top presses, isn't very good. But universities are still struggling to know how to evaluate scholarship not published in traditional print forms. So what are we to make of all this change? How are we to view the mixture of challenges and opportunities that this round of transformation brings us? Our four panelists bring diverse experience and interests to these questions. I shall introduce them <clears throat> all briefly now, as has become customary in these presidential panels, and they will follow one another directly. We should have a fair amount of time for questions and discussion at the end. Sebastian Heath, our first speaker, who is a faculty member at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU, has led our ventures in publishing uh, both print and online, but particularly online. He is an active scholar of Roman ceramics and has a deep background in numismatics. But he's also one of the leading figures in digital humanities, with interests particularly in imaging, especially 3D, and in linked open data. He will reflect both on the potential of this technology and on the experience of running a small, institutionally-based publishing program with the mandate for technological innovation. Fiona McIntosh is professor of classical reception and fellow of St. Hilda's College, the University of Oxford, where she directs the archive of performances of Greek and Roman drama. She is leading a project that aims to produce interactive multimedia books on Medea and Agamemnon, presenting their performance history with a view to reaching a much broader audience than academic publications usually do. Eric Schmidt, the editor for Classics and Religion at the University of California Press, will represent this perennially endangered species, which, like our universities themselves, keep defined predictions of doom by adapting to new circumstances. Beyond the reassuringly familiar facade, there is much change. Eric got a healthy dose of the classics as an undergraduate at St. John's College in Santa Fe and has worked with authors in a variety of historical fields and in art history, as well as in classics and religion. Finally, our new executive director, Helen Collier, will, I hope, give a synoptic view of the system of scholarly communication from the point of view of her experiences in her previous position in the scholarly communications program at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. As I imagine most of you know, before her service at the foundation, she taught classics and ancient philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh, and she thus brings multiple perspectives to bear on our subject. Helen's been called away for the moment by a uh, sudden, completely unexpected crisis, and I do not know whether she is going to make it back here in time to take part in the panel. If she doesn't, we will simply move on uh, directly after Eric into the discussion. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Sebastian. <laughs> 